I've been looking forward to this, and I'd like to thank the stock markets for at least cooperating, giving us something of note that's dramatic. Of course, yesterday's massive down day, both in the Toronto Stock Exchange and the Dow Jones, gives a starting point for us to bring back uh, one of the real legends of analytical tools and an- analytics in Wall Street, Mr. Jim Dines, author of The Dines Letter. Jim, I appreciate so much you finding time for us. And as usual, and this is the sign of the times, there's just so much to talk about. Hello. Hi, Jim. Can you hear me? Oh, now I can, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Hey, i just saying it's just wonderful to get you on on a day when we've had those, uh, you know, yesterday was uh, the kind of day that says, hey, pay attention. We got Jim Dimes coming on the air with us. Uh, you, of course, have not been a fan of what's been going on in the overall market. You've been stepping aside and saying, no, it's much more important to get into the right groups because the overall market won't give you any confidence. And I'm sure what happened yesterday certainly sure doesn't change your mind. Uh, that's right. You know, this is a critical moment in the stock market, and it's wise to pay close attention to it. Let's take a step back to the 2008 crash. At that time, I, I said that a deflation had just begun, so we turned bullish and we became optimistic and then remained that way for six long years until we finally turned pessimistic with our sell signal on December 12, 2014. And since then, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is, of course, the world's leading indicator, has been essentially flat, uh, adjusted for inflation. And I'm not sure that my sell signal toward the stock market was correct. In fact, even now, the Dow is only 3.4% uh, away from our sell signal of nearly two years ago. And on your show, Mike, I, I've been waiting for that breakout, upside or da- downside, and I still expect down, as of today, in an international bear market. Maybe we might get a little rally on Monday, but I still think the trend is the main trend will be down, which is good news for gold and silver investors. Uh, that's based on the Dines theory of gold counter trend. It's no accident that gold was up this year as general markets have been uh, general markets have been soft. And you know, here's where the fun begins. I just went back to review my last two appearances with you, Mike, and anyone in the audience can pull this up on the inter- internet to confirm it at uh, Money Talks website. And the big picture, my gold and silver sell signals beginning um, at the gold top on March 14, 2012, uh, began a long, bitter period. We all sub- endured it as investors in, ra- uh, in ra- raw materials. But then at my February 13, 2016, um, uh, with you um, seven months ago, I finally turned bullish on gold and silver. Very optimistic. And you can check this. I said, quote, I flashed a buy signal on gold and silver two weeks ago in the Dines letter, end quote. And that was two days before gold and silver stocks erupted this year for spectacular profits. If you'd followed me on that one, doubles, triples, and even a four-bagger on low price stocks, such as First Majestic, went from 6 to 25 and that's only since the last time I was on your show. And I tell you, I've never experienced a gold and silver rally this steep before. And I was really lucky with my timing. And I just can't do better than calling the turn, with, uh, calling the turn within two days. And that's it for me. So for new buyers, you've already missed the cream of the move. And you, now you need to make a decision as to whether to wait for a pullback or hold your nose and dive in now. You might go into get half, half your positions now. But I'm still extremely bullish on golds and silvers. The power of the beginning of this move uh, has a long-term meaning to me. I could get back to that. And there have been relatively few pullbacks so far this year. Why? Anybody who held those stocks through the bitter years are not eager to sell. So it's supply and demand. And that's my big picture, bearish on the stock markets and uh, bullish on the uh, precious metals. And uh, I can come back later for the short-term act, uh, short-term outlook. Mike? Yeah, I'll come back to a couple of those things. And uh, let me just ask you one thing here. As, as the markets get so focused on what the Federal Reserve is about to do, you know, I mean, it's, or at least the media does. And then I think, yeah, but I do think it's realistic or, or, or accurate to say that the market also looks at what that Federal Reserve, and it just... Uh, just one of the things, of course, with your broad background in history, uh, just maybe correct me, but it seems like we've never seen more kind of manipulation by central banks than we're exhi- uh, experiencing right now. And uh, I guess I'm asking, does it make a big difference? I mean, that seems to be what Friday's short-term move is about, is uh, they think of the tightening credit. But 
Uh, who knows? Can you just give us a quick perspective on the Federal Reserve and, and the whole central bank activity? Sure. Well, um, you're right. Uh, the mar- the uh, It's because the Fed is desperate. The media has been obsessed with whether uh, Fed head Yellen will raise interest rates or not, and the whole world follows America on that, which is terrible. Which uh, And I believe it's not a path to profits. First of all, nobody seems to know for sure whether higher interest rates are good or bad for the economy. Second, why would a quarter-point interest rate change make a difference to somebody who is considering borrowing? Third, this is a political year in America. I'm skeptical any politician would do anything even remotely controversial before the November 8th election. It's in two months. So Fed had Yellen stalling and hinting she'll raise rates, but so far for the last six years, it's been all talk, no action. And the truth is, I dare to hold the entire Washington economic establishment to task for blind faith in a crackpot theory that was born in the 1930s and is not applicable to today's, to today's world. I cover this in detail in my Goldbach book, but briefly, the economic geniuses in Washington studied the results of the crash in the 1930s, but they failed to look at the cause of the crash in the 1920s. For example, the Genoa Convention, uh, which is almost unheard of. Now, that, uh, I mean, it, uh, people don't even uh, aren't even aware of it. Now, the Fed, the Fed thinks that all they have to do is cut interest rates and print more money and go into more debt, and the world would have permanent prosperity. Uh, it's oblivious to the idea that inflations are always followed by deflations, and we're in one now. So they don't agree with me on that. They keep so as they keep trying to print more to stoke inflation. They, they don't even remember that inflation was the big enemy two years ago, and now they're lusting for it, proving they have no idea what they're doing. And it's the, uh, it's the economists who follow Keynesian economics blindly down a path that's left America with nearly $20 trillion in debt that is unpayable. I cover that, the results, of the punishment of that in my newsletter. But the Fed, Feds worldwide have finally cut interest rates to zero. It's still no stimulation. And finally, the fanatics are actually cutting them to below zero, meaning that you have to pay money to lend money to your bank, which will be, I predict, will be looked back on as incomprehensible economic insanity someday. The Fed was created to eliminate depressions, such as the one in the 30s, but all they've done is postpone what I've been calling the Second Great Depression, the first tremor of which occurred in the 2008 crash, and which is why I, I don't pay much attention to what the Fed does with interest rates. It's the whole structure of their economic strategy that has failed and resulted in poor economic performance with a huge historic debt overhang, which should be kept in mind such debts usually end in tragedy. And, and this is not the time to be careless in my newsletter. I recommend that everybody own some gold or, uh, and or silver coins of the type I describe. Mike? I'm talking to Jim Dines. He's the author of The Dines Letter, which you can find at thedinesletter.com. Jim, just one quick word uh, uh, on that. You just happened to mention the politics. Does it make any difference, really, for investors who wins the presidential election? Well, uh, 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 I have no idea what's going on in America's presidential politics. So my only advice to you is this, is to pray. <laughs> I was talking earlier in the show about uh, libertarian candidate Gary Johnson being asked on television uh, if he had a gun to his head, if he would vote uh, Clinton or Trump, he said, I'd let the gun go off. So there you go. (laughs) Yours is a more optimistic, just pray. Let's come back to gold just for a second here. I mean, uh, one of the things, and I just alluded to earlier on, I looked at the recommendations that you'd made on the show and in the Dimes letter going back uh, several months, and, uh, yeah, the, the ones that doubled in value were the ones that didn't perform well compared to the others, because you had triples and a quadruple in there. Uh, you know, one of the obvious questions, and you sort of alluded to it up front, but is it too late to get in that market? Should we stand aside for a correction and, and maybe then look to jump in? Uh, what's some advice on that? You know, uh, first of all, the size of the company in which you invest has to be a function of the number of things. It includes the quality of management and um, particularly their, or the, uh, the quantity of their ore picture and, and the chart pattern. As a general rule, the higher room here tend to move more sedately. 
and they rise more slowly. In, in this category, I like uh, Silver Wheaton and uh, Agnico Eagle. They've been long-term favorites of mine. While the riskier, price, uh, low-priced ones, they could double or triple quickly. And uh, so which one to buy really depends on your own personal portfolio style uh, or even a mixture of both large and small stocks. And, you know, I've been studying them my entire career as, uh, into, into, uh, into raw materials, and I have a reasonably good sense of the narrative of the many different companies ongoing uh, when they go in either direction. And I'll give you a quick word on both gold and silver. Uh, Jim, uh, just give us a quick word on, on uh, maybe gold, then I've got to take that news break, and then we'll come back and, and get some silver. Mike, I had no idea you had so much power that you could cause an earthquake. No, it's, it's your appearance that's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, as the original gold bug at $35 an ounce, my target was $400, and then it got up, it suppressed, surpassed that to $800. The second wave carried gold to uh, 1889 almost one, $1,900 an ounce. This, I th because of the power of this beginning, I think this might be the third wave I've been waiting for, which will carry toward my long-term targets of 3000 to $5,000 an ounce. Uh, now, nobody's ever believed me on that, I, but I can't allow that to influence my, my careful judgment. And... And when, I, and when gold was at 35, I also recommended silver. And even those few who began to follow me into gold were negative towards silver because they claimed it was an industrial metal then selling at 92 and a half cents. But I predicted it would go to $50 an ounce, and there were people who, who were muttering that I should be sent to prison for such an outrageous prediction. In fact, my prediction came true. And on the second wave, I thought that it would go over $100. Now for the coming third wave, I've been looking for 300 to $500 an ounce, believe it or not. And you can come back and listen to that prediction someday, as I do for many of those. Mike? Uh, there's so much to talk about here, and I, I don't want to cut it short. So I, I, I'll take a break here and come back uh, with Jim. Now, we got a little interrupted there, so I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask him more about uh, a little more elaboration on, I love his point about the size of the mining company. Uh, take a look at some uh, in the gold sector. Uh, come back. Uh, you heard those, uh, uh, Jim, just then saying uh, silver as much as $300 in uh, gold, maybe entering this third wave, which would take it up to between $3,000 and $5,000. So, uh, uh, on my part, duh, there's a lot to talk about with Jim Dines. I'll tell you how to get a hold of uh, the Dines letter, though, right now. All you have to do is just go on the Internet. It's thedinesletter.com, thedinesletter.com. You can get a one-year free uh, fair trial there. Uh, great stuff. And one of the things we never get a chance to chat about, by the way, on the air is what an entertaining read it is, too, uh, with information on a variety of subjects, obviously focused on the markets and the economy, et cetera, and what stocks. Uh, but great stuff with Jim Dines. We'll be back with him in just a moment on the Money Talks Network. Great to have Jim Dines with us. He's the author of The Dines Letter. You can find it at www.dinesletter.com. Coming up, I've also got Ozzy Jurek and a, and a Goofy Award, but I've got lots to talk about with Jim to get to. Jim, I'd, I'd ask you just to backtrack a little bit again about the gold, and, uh, gold mining shares, the silver mining shares. Uh, just a quick word to summarize. Well, uh, do you want to know about the commodity market as a whole, or do you want to know just specific uh, gold stocks? Well, more uh, well, actually both, because, of course, the commodity markets, uh, you were very clear with the coming deflation in 2008 that that was going to be bad news for commodities. Uh, you got out of the gold stocks in 2012, uh, and I just want to, yeah, so, you, okay, let's throw out the bigger commodity market. We've seen the move in gold. We've seen the move in silver. Is this so, uh, sort of a foreshadowing of a bigger move overall with commodities? I do. I think that this cycle of the commodity bear market is over in general, so I'm optimistic. Uh, people don't know where to put their money. To, you know, they've abandoned the idea of getting any reasonably priced income, so, and they've pushed their money into bonds and utilities. You got, they're up to nose, nosebleed heights. But the one thing that always lasts is wealth in the ground, even though it's cyclical. Uh, even when gold was being hammered down, it was only giving it back around 40% of its previous long bull market. So this wave should carry up much higher than the former high. Gold is still gold, and if you've got the guts to ride it out or trying to use timing to get in and out, I think these will outperform many other areas. You see, 
You might recall time, uh, 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 the time that I recommended uh, China. I became the original China bug right after Mao died. I became bullish on commodities because I knew they were going to build their infrastructure from scratch. Well, now India is going to do the same thing. and It will be followed by Africa, which is bullish for natural resources. And my, on a shorter-term basis, my key perception was my sell signal on China three years ago because its infrastructure has pretty much been completed. They're over, overloaded in debt. They've been following the same crackpot economics America and Canada have. And I was predicting a crash there. I'm still alone in the world on that. Nobody believes my pessimism on China. That's okay. I'm used to it. I also think that will be led on the downside by its bank and real estate sectors. sectors. So that's probably why natural resources were hammered down in recent years. But now I see India building its infrastructure, and I think these goals are beginning to move up because of that. In terms of specifics, you know, I said before that there are blue chips. You have uh, the silver Wheaton. Uh, we recommend that uh, at $13. It, it, uh, it only doubled. And um, Agnico Eagle uh, was, is only uh, up 47% uh, from our recommendation. On the lower price ones, um, in the middle ground is uh, Silver Standard. Uh, we recommend that at, uh, on March 4th um, at uh, $2.84, and that's up 331%. We recommended um, uh, uh, Midas Gold is a nice one that we at $0.26 cents, um, on March 16th uh, of this year. Uh, and that's up 139% so far. It's 88 cents now, and I think it's a, we're grading that buy on pull, pullbacks. And um, and uh, Mill Rock Resources is a new one. Um, we added that in, uh, in August uh, at 39 cents. It's still around there. I still like that one. Um, so there, you know, there's a range of stocks to buy. You need to figure out what quality and risk you can afford to take. Let me just change gears just for a second, a different area of the market, because you are a pioneer in this area also, and that's the marijuana legalization opportunities that would create in the investment <coughs> market. Excuse me. Um, can you give us just a quick overview there? Sure. Um, you know, medical marijuana is to me the next new big bull market. Canada is going to be one of the leaders in it. And I figured two years ago that the American election would have several states voting to legalize medical marijuana, including California. So stockpots would get a big play. However, two years ago was too early for what I described at the time as a probing attack, a military term, I means using a small patrol. And it was very useful to me because I began to get a beat on which companies I liked in this brand new field. You see, it's always very hard to get into a new bull market because who really knows which which ones the big gainers are going to be. I picked Amazon in 1998, but I missed, uh, I missed uh, a couple of kids in the garage uh, at, uh, that became Microsoft. So yes. I've, I've got a list of eight uh, to buy, and seven of the eight are up so far, which is phenomenal for a brand-new bull market. But uh, I'm still going to be pruning and adding to uh, newer investment, to newer ones as investments emerge, and several of them are in Canada, and I hope they don't go up in smoke. <laughs> well, that's one of the a great reasons to subscribe to the Dines letter. I mean, obviously, you've got a brilliant track record uh, in identifying uh, nascent bull markets, and then you sift through uh, what's going on out there, and then you try and pick out who's going to be the market leader, and that's a big challenge also, uh, you know, after you've chosen uh, what's about to be hot. And uh, this will be no different than this one. But I think it's a fascinating area, and as you say, it's explosive, and we'll get more news uh, coming up in the November election. Jim, I want to thank you for finding time for us today. I've kept you a little longer, but uh, as always, it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, you're welcome. It's always a pleasure being on your show. I've always had fun with you. You're a good reporter. Great reporter. Great stuff. Thanks, Jim. You can find more on the Dines Letter by going to www.thedinesletter.com. I'll take a break. I've got Ozzy Jurek coming up shortly. I've also got a shocking stat next for you, plus a goofy award. You're listening to Money Talks on the Money Talks Network. As we say, better late than never. Time now for this week's quote of the week. This comes from David Hume. He's an 18th century Scottish philosopher. He observed that governments prefer debt to taxes since the costs are hidden and intergenerational, enabling a minister, in quotes, to make a great figure during his administration without overburdening the people with taxes, the practice will therefore almost infallibly be abused in every government. 
In other words, governments absolutely prefer debt to taxes because they don't get the immediate outcry. David Hume, 18th century Scottish philosopher. Time now for this week's shocking stat of the week. We mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I think it deserves a heck of a lot more attention. It's my thanks to Vincent uh, Gillas and Andre Moreau of the Montreal Economic Institute. <clears throat> I'm going to borrow from Jeopardy and start with a shocking stat. The number, 133,000 to 189,000. Alex, the number of Canadians who are pushed into poverty because of the co- cost of supply management. The price of milk, cheese, butter, poultry, and eggs are all held artificially high through a system of production quotas and tariffs on lower-priced imports by government. It's what government is creating this. And as of uh, this past September 1st, the price of industrial milk, it's going up. It went up for a second time in the year. And not a surprise to see that the people who can least afford it are at the lower end of the income scale, of course. But here's the number to remember. If Canadians were free to import their dairy and poultry products from the U.S., the average household would save $438 per year. Major money to people on the lower end of the income scale. And if you use, it doesn't matter which measure of poverty. I mean, there's a type that's called uh, basic needs, and that means you're not getting your basic needs met. Uh, there's another type, uh, which is a relative measure, low uh, stats cans, low income cutoff. Doesn't matter which, uh, which measure. As Goloso and Moreau estimate, the extra cost pushes between 133,000 and 189,000 Canadians below either of these two poverty measures. And by the way, the number of farm families it helps, only 13,500. But that number for you personally, your family, the average household would save $438 if we are allowed to freely import dairy and poultry products. That's a heck of a lot of money. That's this week's shocking stat. I'll take a break. I'll come back. I got Aussie jerk. So much to get to him with. And I got a goofy award. So stay with us. I've got a goofy award coming up for you. I've also uh, got Ozzy Jurek on the line right now. It's so much to talk about with Ozzy. Hey, by the way, I think, is it next weekend? No, the 24th, I think you've got your outlook for 2017 conference. Yeah, I imagine our 24th year, we've got 12 speakers. We've got the U.S. speaker, U.S. financing experts. You know, all the listings we've been talking about, Phoenix, and we've got a couple more today, will be on display but particularly, we'll talk about what will the new tax effect will be. Will we crash in sales or will we actually uh, turn the corner as we seem to have in one of the buildings in Vancouver right now, the Cadero almost sold out on a pre-sale basis at 1800 a foot. Can you imagine? So yeah. some people are not as worried about the tax. So all of these things are debated and you, you're going to walk away with 100 properties under 100,000 in BC, BC and 100 properties under 100,000 in U.S., which we think are going to be buyers. So it's going to be a really exciting day. So that's, uh, that's uh, coming up on the, uh, the 24th, though. I want to make sure I got that date right because I, I knew, knew there's tons of speakers, everything happening at the Real Estate Outlook for you at 2017, looking forward. But that's the 24th. Uh, and I suppose they can just go to jurok.com for tickets, eh, Ozzy? Yeah, and we got a special uh, prize. It's two for ninety seven today. If you go to Juroc dot com, J U R O C K dot com, or call us at six eight three eleven eleven. Well, as you said, one of the things you're going to be talking about is uh, the impact of the taxes. And I'd had several questions already saying, do we have any idea how much the foreign buyers tax, that new fifteen percent tax, uh, had impacted uh, you know government revenues? And uh, it's just, I, I had a heck of a time trying to find anything on it. Yeah, well, it's really tricky because the province didn't start tracking foreign residential real estate buyers until June 12th, and it still doesn't track any foreign commercial or farmland buyers and so on. But if you look at the figures of foreign buyers in the first five weeks of tracking the foreign buyers, and particularly take a period between June 10 and July 14, foreign buyers spent about a billion dollars residential real estate in BC. The tax didn't kick in until August 2. So, and this is a long shot guess, Mike, but if the same pace continued at about 200 per week, the province could bring about a billion six annually under the tax. But remember, they also pay the existing property purchase tax, which is 3% on homes over 2 million, 1% on the first 200, and 2% on the portions in between. So let's make it easy on me. Let's take the average at 2% overall. Then there'll be another 31 million years. So the province could be collecting somewhere between 1.6 billion and maybe even as much as $2 billion a year. But, of course, we don't really know because sales have plummeted after the taxes introduced 
And really, nobody has any specific ideas, but that's how much it could be. You know, of course, one of the aspects of that, and it actually alludes to uh, my editorial up front, is people have to understand that you always look at whatever policy is put in place, what will it do to capital? Will it encourage it or discourage it? Uh, again, I can't believe how dense people who think politics first are about that kind of stuff. It's a very simple thing. Uh, we do it ourselves in our personal lives. Somebody puts something on sale. We travel over there with our money and vice versa. So one of the big things, Ozzy, that people have been talking about is what's the fallout in other markets? Uh, and I was thinking about Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, maybe the fact that we're throwing on a foreign buyer's tax uh, here may encourage some capital to go over there. So I'm just wondering what's the latest there. Well, also, we should remember that that foreign capital is smart money. These people don't have $3 million to invest because they're stupid. So they also know what the world is like, say, in Calgary and Edmonton. And right now, Mike, it's heading to Toronto in, in a major way. You know, Toronto has had an all-time record ever in August. In fact, selling more houses in Toronto than anywhere else all over Canada together. And the values are up, the, the biggest sales are up. But, you know, looking at Calgary and Edmonton, uh, the resale condo market isn't really that bad. I mean, Edmonton has some 2,600 sales from 6,300 listings this year. Calgary had some 1,700 sales from 4,500 listings. But the real estate board in Calgary says that they're at the lowest level the sales are since 2003. Price is about 252 in Edmonton on average for condo. In Calgary, it's about 370. And those prices are down about 7% in Calgary, but really only about 1% in Edmonton. So where the big uh, thing is going to happen is the unsold inventory. There's some 526 open in Calgary and so on. So there's at least a six-month supply. And we are now seeing that residential sales have been falling for 21 straight months in Calgary. It's going to get a little worse before it gets better. And the foreign buyer probably knows that as well. But I think we love Calgary and Edmonton. And we will advise you to go back with some stink bits, but not yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're waiting for some timing on that. So the, the volume, I just want to get straight. I'm not, sorry, not the volume. The supply is still there. You've got at least a six-month supply, then you're saying, of apartments on uh, you know market in, in Edmonton or Calgary. So uh, obviously, you're going to see developers scrambling, maybe get a deal on a presale on that stuff. Absolutely, and you're right, and that's where the the pain is because you know the developer's committed. He's in the ground. He's got the financing range, and if the sales don't come, there's a problem. So yes, that's that's what exactly we're telling our subscribers: go in with a stink bit. You know, they'll still look at you. They'll they won't smile, but they might. You might get the deal of a lifetime. Yeah, especially if it's a, a cash offer, you know, or a no subject, and because right. that's what they'll be interested in is getting the money, not having some sort of subject thing. So. Uh, maybe a good thing. Hey, we got time for a couple of hot properties. Yeah, we got a lot of inquiries last week about the properties we had in Paradise uh, in, uh, in, a, in a, sm a, sm a small um, a small area and Surprise. Um, actually, Surprise is a, is a suburb of, of Phoenix. So three bedrooms, yeah, two so bathrooms. You're looking in the Phoenix area is what we're saying here. Yeah, yeah, in the Phoenix area, a really great area because white boulevards and so on. But a nice 1,100 square foot single family home. It doesn't have a pool, but it's only 165,000. And then a 3,300 square foot home with a pool, totally renovated. Should see the pictures. It's amazing on a 319,000. So for the price of a front door, you can buy some real fine real estate. You're just teasing me every time you do this, <laughs> but I can I can I can satiate my appetite every weekend by going to jurok.com and looking at the hot property button. In the meantime, Ozzy. Hey, people, you can just go to Jurok.com also and get your tickets for the uh, sorry September 24th Outlook 2017 conference, September 24th coming up, or go to 604-683-1111. You can see Ozzy there, and apparently uh, they will sell out again, but Ozzy will be wearing later hosen sometime in that <laughs> afternoon, so it's going to be a fabulous event. Yeah, the legs of are course. worth the price of admission. <laughs> I will, I will, just for you, I will. <laughs> there you go. Ozzy, have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. Thank you. My thanks to Ozzy. My thanks to Jim Dines. My thanks to Mike Levy, uh, Craig Burroughs, all of that. Great show today. Uh, of course, Money Talks is brought to you by Solera Club. Solera Club is a royalty-based investment, meaning you get paid first. Uh, there are no fees with it, and it's in the tech sector. Uh, get some more information by going to soleraclub.com. Time now for this week's Goofy Award. I'm going to be brief and I'm going to be blunt with this week's Goofy. And I know it just invites hate mail when I even mention a passing criticism of Prime Minister Trudeau. 
uh, which is always just interesting when people have so much faith in their politicians. But in China this past week, his comment that Canada had human rights problems just like China was way over the line. Yes, Canada was issued a strong rebuke by the United Nations with regard to our First Nations people. And I might add, that has nothing to do with me or anyone else in the private sector. That was all government. It's a tragedy. It's been pointed out for years. It's got everything to do with the government and Native elites. No one else. But that's not my goofy. But to suggest for a moment that there is some sort of equivalency with China and Canada is absurd. It also demonstrates a a tremendous disrespect. It's a slap in the face of those who have served our country, defending our freedom, and the men and women who have suffered and been killed protesting for even basic freedoms in China. I mean, it's incredible contrast. I mean, I can make this comment, for example, without fear of retribution, other than a few hate mails. Our government is incompetent on the First Nations file, yes, culturally insensitive, imperialistic in the past, but that doesn't come close to China. As the Ottawa Citizen pointed out, Human Rights Watch states that the Chinese government, in quote, systematically curtails a wide range of fundamental human rights, including freedom of expression, association, assembly, and religion. Amnesty International states it bans peaceful groups like the Falun Gong and uses the death penalty with impunity. So to suggest, as the Prime Minister did, that just because Canada is not perfect, somehow puts us in the same league of China, is absurd and without foundation. I just, one of those others, wow, when I read that comment. But no worries. That kind of apologist rhetoric helped term him the nickname Little Potato in China. And a Hello Magazine spread or a CBC special be far behind. Yeah, he gets my goofy, and I think he deserves it. Hey, that's all the time we have. I hope you go to moneytalks.net. You can get the daily comments on a regular basis. Uh, also, of course, you can join us at... Uh, Michael Campbell's Money Talks on Facebook, Michael Campbell's Money Talks on Facebook, or Money Talks Tweet, but we update Facebook every single day. In the meantime, I hope you go out. I hope you have a terrific weekend, and I do appreciate you listening.